All right, welcome to week five of micro. We are going to be jumping into Staphylococcus this week. So I'm just going to pull up the PowerPoint here. I'm pretty excited to finally get going on actually learning different bacteria. So we're finally there that we can start with bacteria. So we're going to concentrate this week and next week all on gram positive cocci bacteria, which goes along with the case study that you guys have been assigned and that will be due at the end of week six. And those instructions will all be in the announcements coming out either today or tomorrow. There's a video um, coming out on what I expect for that to help you. So anyway, back to this. Staphylococcus is going to be our first gram pos coxy bacteria group. So these are grouped together because they are all gram pos coxy and they're all catalase positive. Catalase is a test that we perform in the lab very commonly. So basically, I've always told you guys, we always gram stain first. So what happens is when we read a plate and we identify what organism we want to test, we gram stain it. If it is a gram positive coxy, the very next test that we always run is catalase. And the reason we run catalase next is it will tell us if it's a staphylococcus, which would be catalase positive. If it's catalase negative, it would be a streptococcus, which we're going to learn next week. So catalase really separates and differentiates whether it's staph or strep. That's because those are the biggest groups of gram pos coxy that we talk about. So we really want to separate between those two, so catalase does that for us. So in the case of staph, all staph are catalase positive. And then a reminder on what gram pos coxy looks like. Again, the color and shape, they will of course be dark purple for the positive, and then there'll be balls for the coxy. All right, so here are some of your major staph organisms. There is a ton of staph out there. Um, by no means is this list comprehensive. There is definitely more than just this list. I'm just mentioning some that maybe you'll hear more of than others, and so I definitely want you to take away at least these items. So we're going to start up with here at the top, and this is, of course, our biggest pathogen. I think we've all heard of staph aureus at this point. It is a huge pathogen. We see it very commonly in the lab. So if anything, you better know Staph aureus. Um, all right, so we're going to discuss on this slide the reservoir and then the mode of transmission for each of these. Staph aureus is reservoir. It is found as normal flora in the nares, which are your like nostrils, your nasopharynx, your perineal area, and your little bit of skin. Not a lot of skin, a little bit. Like, I don't even like that that it says that. Um, Mode of transmission, again, if it's introduced by a surgical instrument, like maybe that wasn't cleansed well enough, fomites, which are again non-living things like countertops, doorknobs, um, through the air, through unwashed hands of healthcare workers. There are so many ways that staph aureus is passed, so just it's going to vary. There's a ton of mode of transmissions for staph aureus. All right, the next one is called staph epidermidis, or what we commonly just say staph epi. If you look at the second name of that, epidermidis is going to tell you that it's a huge normal flora of our skin, Epiderm epidermis for, epi for skin. Oh, I can't talk. So yeah, it is huge normal flora of our skin and mucous membranes. Pretty much staph epi doesn't cause a ton of diseases. It's usually found as contamination in the micro lab because it's so easily picked up off the skin. So if they were doing a wound culture and they accidentally got a little bit of skin, um, like it touched the skin while they were collecting it, then it, you could easily find staph epi growing as contamination. The times that it does result in a disease is usually from being passed with a surgical or medical device. So that'll introduce it into what should have been a sterile area in that person's body. And if it was hanging out on that surgical or medical device, then it can get introduced and that's when it will tend to cause infection. Otherwise, for the most part, it's usually contamination. Staph hemolyticus and staph lungodensis, very similar um, where they're found as normal flora, skin and mucous membranes like staph epi. Again, passed a lot similarly to staph epi as well. Staph saprophyticus is a more common one that we might see. This is normal flora of the skin and the genital urinary tract, which that's going to come in important here in a second. So this staph sapro is very commonly found with UTIs, urinary tract infections, especially in young women that are sexually active. And the reason is because it's found as normal flora in the genital urinary and upon 
intercourse, it can get introduced further in, which would lead to a UTI, especially if those women aren't cleansing well enough afterwards. So it's really been linked heavily with younger women for UTIs, so definitely note that. Um, typically, it's a community-acquired UTI, meaning it didn't happen in the hospital. They didn't get it nosocomially in the hospital. Usually, it's just something they achieve outside of the hospital. And then you're going to notice the last one here is called micrococcus. It's not called staphylococcus. It's called micrococcus. So it's a little bit of a different group of gram coxi, but we put them in the same chapter as staph because they share very similar characteristics to staph. They are micrococci, are gram coxi that are catalase positive, just like staph. They are very huge normal flora of our skin, mucous membranes, our, our pharynx. You will probably never see them cause a disease. Um, it says they're rarely implicated in infections. Extremely rare for micrococcus to cause a disease. The reason I mention it to you guys is it's definitely seen as contamination in the lab. So if anybody were to ever say to you, oh, that's just micrococcus, at least you've heard of it. At least you know what they're talking about. Um, it is contamination. Because it's such a part of the skin, just like staph epi, it can easily be picked up if they didn't collect a sample properly or something. All right, so let's discuss a little bit more on our big bad boy, staph aureus, the virulence factors of it. Staph aureus is considered the most virulent of all the staphylococci, and that basically means it's the best at causing disease. It really is a great pathogen causing bacteria. It has lots of things that it produces that help it cause that disease, and those are virulence factors. So here is some listing of virulence factors that Staph aureus can possess and release while it does its damage. So it has different toxins, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, that really act on um, patient cells and really help destroy those cells. It has a item called leukocytin that also helps destroy phagocytes when it tries to come over and engulf and destroy the bacteria. This leukocytin can help kind of get rid of the phagocytes. It has what we call clumping factor or coagulase. Coagulase is an enzyme. We actually run a test in the lab called a coagulase test, and staph aureus is hugely known to be coagulase positive because it has that enzyme coagulase. So that will be a test that you guys are going to run in your labs. So that'll be really fun for you guys get to see the coagulase test. And staph aureus is just always positive for coagulase. There's also another enzyme that's called hyaluronidase that it possesses that kind of help break down the tissues, the connective tissues. And it has more toxins here listed at the bottom. The one that's listed as TSST-1, that's actually your toxic shock syndrome toxin. Um, for women, that should ring a bell to you. Growing up, if you, when you started using tampons, there's a huge blurb in every insert that comes in tampon boxes about toxic shock syndrome. If you leave your tampon in too long, it could lead to risk of getting toxic shock syndrome. Men, you're probably not as familiar with it for that reason, since you obviously don't play with tampons. But women, this is probably something that should ring a bell to you, toxic shock syndrome. Um, so Staph aureus is one of the bacteria that will cause toxic shock syndrome, and it has toxins that help lead to doing that. All right, as far as the disease goes, what does it cause? Pretty much anything. Staph aureus can cause almost anything in the lab. Like, when you think of it, it can be linked with anything. Um, skin infections, it's huge with skin infections. There's a bunch listed there, folliculitis, which is inflammation of the hair follicle, different boils. Impetigo is like a children's skin infection. Lots of wound infections, lots of deeper wound infections as well, maybe things like into the organs even, the bones. Scalded skin syndrome is so another skin one. Food poisoning. Again, toxic shock syndrome, UTIs, um, pneumonia, like the list just goes on and on and on and on. So we named a few here, but just basically no, Staph aureus, huge cause of disease, pretty much can cause any infection. All right, a little bit on Staph epidermidis now that we're done talking about Staph aureus. Staph epi, again, is that one that's a really big normal flora of the skin. That's why it's named epidermidis. And I said before, it's pretty much contamination a lot of times. The only time it really causes disease is with medical or surgical devices. So that's what you're going to see here is the virulence factor that Staph epi does have 
um, is called an exopolysaccharide slime, or it makes what we call a biofilm. Biofilms, oh my God, you guys have to Google biofilms. There are some disgusting pictures on there. Um, but biofilms are basically a community of organisms that live together. They're really sticky. They adhere really well to areas because they have this slime. And so a staph epi can make a biofilm together. It can be all these little colonies together making this thing. And when they go to try to like, if you were to try to kill it off because it's so sticky and slimy and it's got this whole exopolysaccharide surface area, it doesn't get killed off easily. It can hang on and retain on a surface and that's how it can really get involved with medical devices and surgical equipment is because it can make that slimy area and it really hangs on, it doesn't come off easily. And so when you go to use the equipment, it gets introduced into that patient's body into an area that wouldn't usually have bacteria, and then the staph epi can cause disease. So if you look down here, first bullet says, yes, yeah, usually a contaminant. Second and down, talk about how it's a nosocomial infection with these different medical devices, an indwelling catheter, a prosthetic cardiac valve, catheter sites, other prosthetics. So you see kind of why it's linked with surgical and medical devices there. And that's the only disease that I need for you to know with staph epi. Otherwise, it's pretty much contamination. I will say this. You will know what a biofilm is as soon as I mention this. A, one example, a very common example of a biofilm is plaque. Plaque on your teeth is biofilms. It's a community of organisms living there, thriving, slimy, like that is plaque. Plaque is a biofilm. That is one type of biofilm. You look up online, there's a whole bunch of things. Like if you guys use those kitchen sponges, kitchen sponges are notorious for biofilms. I won't use them. Um, I refuse to use kitchen sponges. Now, granted, maybe they're in my kitchen washcloths too, but Kitchen sponges are just much more notorious for getting biofilms, and there is pictures on there. There's one college that did a whole study on it that I found it on where it showed it up close, what it looks like. It, it, you'll just never use them again. <laughs> um, pipes. Pipes can get biofilms built up in there, you know, different things like that. It's kind of crazy. So anytime you think of plaque now, this is what you get to think of. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Staph hemolyticus and staph lugdunensis, very similar to staph epi there, so we've already talked all about that. Staph sapro, so staph saprophyticus was the big one with UTIs in younger females, especially. We're not real certain of the virulence factors here, but we already mentioned the disease for you to know, so we've discussed that. Micrococcus, again, very low virulence, meaning it barely does anything for disease, so it's pretty much just contamination is all you need to remember for micrococcus disease. Okay, so to diagnose bacteria, again, we always gram stain right away, gram pus coxy. When it, they are a staph gram pus coxy, typically you'll notice on the gram stain they tend to cluster, whereas next week when we learn about streps, mostly streps tend to chain. Now, just because you look at a gram stain and say, oh, it's gram pus coxy clusters, it has to be staph, we can't, of course, just say that. We just know that in our heads, oh, this might be a staph, you know, but you keep testing it like you would normally. Um, there is a special media that I want to mention here. Of course, to grow out staph, staph will easily grow out in blood auger and chocolate auger. Remember, those are both supportive augers that will grow pretty much everything. Um, so staph will definitely grow on those. Staph will also easily grow on CNA and PEA augers because remember, CNA and PEA are the two augers that grow gram positives, so staph will grow on those. There's also one other auger that we've never heard of before yet until today is mannitol salt auger. Very much a selective auger just for the purpose of screening for staph aureus. Because staph aureus is such a huge pathogen, we have this special auger that some labs like to use to really help screen for that staph aureus. Um, so just remember mannitol salt auger for staph aureus. All right, like I said earlier at the beginning, after we know it's a gram pus coxy, we always run catalase next. That's our next test because that will truly tell us if we have a staph or a strep. In bold, it reminds you that yes, all staph are catalase positive. So this is like the simplest test you'll ever run in lab and it's actually really fun because it's just so simple and easy. All we're doing is we're looking for the enzyme catalase inside the bacteria and staph have the enzyme catalase. So the reagent that we use in lab is actually just hydrogen peroxide right off of your shelves at Walgreens. 
hydrogen peroxide. So we grab that. And we basically put a drop of that on a microscope slide like it shows you down here. You take a little bit of your colonies with a loop off the auger, just like one or two colonies with the loop, maybe even a half a colony if it's big size colonies. You smear it into the hydrogen peroxide and you look for bubbles. If it bubbles, it's positive. If there's no bubbles, it's negative. It is that simple. It's kind of awesome. Um, so you'll definitely get to do that this week and see that. Just a note that in case there is a test question or a question somewhere, hydrogen peroxide in um, chemical formula initials is H2O2. So if you ever see H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide, just so you don't get confused. All right, so remember, staffs are all catalase positive. Once we see that it's catalase positive, the very next test that we run is coagulase. And the reason we run this next is we know for a fact that Staph aureus has the enzyme coagulase. I mentioned that earlier. And because Staph aureus is the biggest pathogen out of all the Staphs, we want to know right away if we have Staph aureus or not. So let's make sure we test for Staph aureus. If it's not Staph aureus, then we'll figure out something else. So that's why we always run coagulase next is we see Staph aureus all the time, so we might as well see if we have it. So. This will help determine if we have Staph aureus versus other Staph. So Staph aureus will actually produce two different forms of the enzyme coagulase. There's a bound form and a free form. The bound form is commonly called a clumping factor. And it's called bound because it's actually bound to the bacteria cell wall and reacts with fibrinogen in our body. This will basically cause the cells to clump together and make it look agglutinated. I think you guys have all seen agglutination. So that's what you see. With this test, if you were to do the bound coagulase test, you're going to see agglutination as your positive results. And that will tell you, yes, but coagulase was here because it reacted with fibrinogen and formed agglutination. The free coagulase enzyme test is basically looking for free coagulase. Um, it does this in a tube, and this basically will form like a jelly looking like clot, and that would be your positive results. So here's the pictures, because pictures are always better. Um, so we commonly call the clumping factor test the slide test. So that's the one on the left here. So that would be your clumping factor coagulase test is the slide one. Again, this is something I think you guys will do. I think you guys all have the slide test in your labs. So again, if you see agglutination, it is definitely coagulase positive. No agglutination, coagulase negative. The right side is showing you the tube, which is looking for the free coagulase. Again, if it's positive, it forms that jelly-like little clot there at the bottom. If it's negative, there's just no clot. Okay. Here's more pictures. Apparently, I thought you could never have too many pictures. So slide, tube, you get the idea. A lot of times, what I should say before I move off this is, now, again, not every lab is the same, but some labs like to have both of these tests on hand, whereas other labs only have one of the coagulase tests on hand. So a lot of labs just use one. They think that's good enough. If it's positive, it's positive. If it's not, it's not. Whereas other labs have the idea that once they see it's positive with the slide test, then they will confirm it with the tube test to make sure it truly is positive. So a lot of times they'll use like the slide test or one of them as screening and the other one as confirmatory. So you might see that if they decide to run both tests at their lab. Okay, for colony morphology, um, on the, basically on the blood agar plate, what do the bacteria look like? This is of course probably the very first thing you ever do is you look at the colony morphology how they and you describe it, what it looks like, and then you gram stain it, and then you catalase, and then you coagulase. So, for micrococcus, the one that's mostly contamination, micrococcus is kind of fun because it can take almost any color. It could be almost any color. It's really kind of neat. It can be white, tan, yellow, orange, pink, and I've seen it all of those colors. Um, so, yeah, if I ever see, like, a pink color, I'm like, oh, that's micrococcus. You know, and it's usually, like, it's not usually very much that's on there. Um, Staph aureus, definitely need to know what Staph aureus looks like on the blood agar since it is our main pathogen. I'll just say the staffs in general are larger, like medium to large size colonies are really creamy looking, whereas next week when we learn strep, those are small colonies. So staffs tend to be larger colonies than streps. 
So Staph aureus is a creamy yellow. Aureus actually stands for yellow. It means gold. So that kind of goes with the color it takes on the auger plate. It tends to have, I mean, it's not going to be like a bright yellow in your face, like that's yellow. It's going to be a subtle, got a yellow hue to it. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't look yellow at all. But a lot of times it might have this like little yellow hue to it. And that stems from its name. Aureus means gold. And actually, if you look at the first two initials of Aureus, AU, AU is the periodic element um, initials for gold, you know, in that periodic table. All right, the other big thing with Staph aureus to know is it's definitely beta hemolytic. So I would definitely remember that as well. Staph epi is another good one that I would want to remember. These are gray or white colonies, and they are very much non-hemolytic. You could probably call it gamma hemolytic. Staph hemolyticus, Staph hominis, which I haven't mentioned Staph hominis until now, but it's again there. There's a ton of Staph. Staph lugdunensis all tend to kind of be very similar in appearance, um, buttery-like, yellowy, orange, cream. Um, so again, all these staphs can tend to look very similar. Staph saprophyticus can maybe sometimes have a glossy appearance. It's still, again, creamy. Usually it's white-gray. Usually staph sapro looks a lot like staph epi. I'll just say that. They usually look very much alike. Oops, I don't know what I just hit. Okay, so this is just a chart that was in a previous textbook that we used to use. I really don't need you to know these last three like columns, I guess you call them, <laughs> last three columns. You can actually straight up X those out. Um, this is just to show you again, staph and micrococcus are both catalase positive. Next week we'll learn about enterococcus, so you can ignore this for now if you'd like. Oxidase is a test that's primarily run on gram-negative bacteria. We wouldn't run oxidase usually on gram positive. If you were to run it, though, just note that staphs are all oxidase negative, but micrococcus is oxidase positive. Um, just an explanation on the aero tolerance. FA means facultative anaerobe. Basically, that means that it can grow in oxygen or without oxygen. So staphs very much can grow in aerobic or anaerobic environments. They don't care. They'll grow either way. Same with enterococcus. All right, staph aureus versus staph intermediate. Now, we've talked a lot about how Staph aureus is definitely coagulate positive. That's a huge, huge characteristic of it. Once in a while, we'll stumble across another staph that can sometimes be coagulase positive as well. Most of the other staphs are coagulase negative. In fact, we call them coagulase negative staphs to say that it's everything but Staph aureus. But we do have a bugger here called Staph intermediate that once in a while, depending on the strain, can show up coagulase positive. So they put a V here for variable, meaning that, yep, some of these strains may have coagulase positive, whereas most of them are coagulase negative, but once in a while you get it showing up. In that case, there's other tests, of course, that we can run to help differentiate which one is which. Um, a couple, there, these two are of a mention to help separate them, and you can see how they do that. If you were to perform the VP, Vogue Proxcar test, Staph aureus would be positive, staph intermediates would be negative. If you were to run a PYR test, staph aureus would be negative, but staph intermediates would be positive. Um, so you can see how that really tells them apart, even so that you can know which one is more which. There's lots more tests out there that we would run. We might not always run these ones per se, but you know, it's just a good example. Um, I did mention staph intermediates earlier, staph intermediates is linked with a bunch of different stuff. One thing it's really linked with a lot is dog bite wounds. Um, so I would just take that away and know that for now. And then treatments. Um, usually we're running a susceptibility test that to see what antibiotics are resistant or susceptible to treat the staph with. There is a very common drug resistant staph aureus called methicillin resistant staph aureus. In fact, you guys just did your discussion post on this this last week, so you already kind of heard of this. You know about methicillin resistant staph aureus. That unfortunately, it's becoming more and more common. Instead of using any of the beta lactams, basically it means it's resistant to all of the beta lactams, which are your main group of antibiotics, so all your penicillins, the moxicillins, all those guys. Instead of using those, we can use vancomycin commonly to treat MRSA. Um, vancomycin is a drug that very much targets gram positives. Um, that was one of the members of the glycopeptide group. There has unfortunately been cases that have also developed resistance to vancomycin, and those are called 
versa, V-R-S-A. In that case, it gets harder. Now we're combining antibiotics to treat it. And if it, it's just, it's getting scarier the more resistance that starts to happen. Um, I'll have to check into the number of cases. This was a long time ago, several years ago, that they quoted it was only six in, that they knew of at that time. I'm not sure if that changed or not. Maybe your um, lab instructor, who I think most of your lab instructors work in a hospital too, they might know if that has become higher than just six. All right, so that's staff. I think it will really help when you guys get to the lab and are able to perform some of these tests, um, the calyx and the coagulase. It makes it so much more simple. Next week, we'll learn all about the streps and enterococcus. That way, we can kind of have a holistic picture of grandpa's coxy bacteria. So if you guys, again, need anything, as always, you know, to reach out, please do so. I would love to help you know why you're struggling on your own. Okay, otherwise have a great week and we'll talk to you later.